There's literally no latency. And it even runs in HD. How is that even possible? Modern gaming displays are not good enough, and some of them are basically a waste of money compared to CRTs. Are CRTs really still better than modern displays? I've been saying yes for years, but I hadn't actually gotten the real data to back up these claims. This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to the extended cut of this video along with multiple exclusive videos about CRTs and other content on my own streaming site Nebula, bundled with CuriosityStream at the link below. Having recently bought a fancy gaming monitor for my gaming setup in the house, the Samsung Odyssey G7, a 1440p 240Hz display with G-Sync compatibility, it's nice, but I've always felt like it should be better. So naturally, as things go, when my wife and I swapped out our desks to sit-stand desks, a CRT went back on my desk. After years of making video essays about CRT TVs and monitors and seeing them unexpectedly gain more popularity, it was time to look back through a modern lens and see if I have any reason to keep this 70 pound hunk on my desk or if I really did waste my money. Plus, other people are holding me accountable here too. Clarity, depth and image presentation, input lag, and overall usability. We're covering it all. So warm up your tubes, plug in your RCA jacks, and grab a snack. Join me on this awesome journey of evaluating if CRTs were as good as we say and whether we've been throwing away money on gaming monitors for all these years. CRT TV sets and PC monitors have a fair bit of differences in terms of what they could do, how they looked, and what the usability you could get out of them was. While there are some exceptions that we'll note as we go, CRT TVs were primarily only compatible with signals that operated up to 15 kHz bandwidth that would primarily be 240p and 480i content. Meanwhile, PC monitors mainly only worked with 31 kHz signal, 480p and higher. I'll be discussing both in this video, and there are plenty of similarities between them, which is why if I just say CRTs, in general, I'm probably talking about both. What even is a CRT? CRT means cathode ray tube, and displays work by shooting electrons from a cathode ray gun in the back of the box to the front. This is very different than how modern LCD and LED screens work. CRT monitors are big, bulky, and heavy, and they don't support modern video connections. So they're useless, right? Well. That common perception is only partially true. They do take up more room than flat screens, but they're not always huge. CRT monitors do have to fit on a desk, or at least desks from the 90s and early 2000s after all. CRTs are available in a plethora of sizes, colors, and even shapes. There's a lot more personality to CRTs than the flat black design of just about every modern screen. As someone who obviously loves having unique looks for my setups, the black rectangle gets old. But specs-wise, I have always made sure to have room for on my desks for CRTs but I have been curious as if I could maybe finally stop doing that. Unlike their TV counterparts, PC CRTs haven't had anywhere near as much of a resurgence in popularity for retro gaming, at least other than the FW900, which we'll talk about that in a bit. But PC CRTs still have redeeming qualities that make them fun for enthusiasts and just for those of us who prefer CRTs to LCDs in general, it naturally makes sense to extend that to computer use as well. CRT discussions constantly bring up clarity and sharpness. Sounds insane, right? CRTs only supported low resolutions and don't have any of the new screen technology. So what gives? Do I really believe that these monitors have sharper images than high-res LCDs? N no. Well, it's, it's more complicated than that. Much how most Hollywood films aren't shot at a native 4K, yet look better than any YouTuber's 4K content, raw sharpness doesn't entirely determine how good or clear an image looks. Fundamentally, CRTs just display an image differently than LCDs. I'll let Bob from RetroRGB, one of the best resources, websites, YouTube channels, communities, to keep up to date with all things retro, explain it to you real fast. That's something that you don't need to be a nerd to understand or even appreciate. And I've been doing a ton of tests where I watch some content on a CRT and then pause it in the middle and switch over to a projector, an OLED, adding filters, whatever else I could come up with. And I've dragged everybody in my family into this and some friends, uh, including people and especially people who just don't care at all about the nerdy side of things. And every one of them 
always can see a difference. Uh, they could, whether it's something they could describe or whether it's the perception of a difference. And it really just comes down to the root of how these things are made because, and how they generate their image. Absolutely a different way that your brain interprets it because CRTs rely on persistence of vision because it really is a single beam of light drawing a frame and then starting over again. And it's a totally different look than an LCD or an OLED panel or, or any flat panel really that uh, that presents its image in a different way. So it's something that it's impossibly hard to convey unless you could sit somebody down in front of a TV. And it's a funny thing too, because if somebody asks, you know, what's the best way to play a pre HD video game console? So something that never came with an HDMI port, or what's the best way to watch old TV shows that were poorly thrown onto a DVD, or maybe you could only find them on VHS or, or laser disc. The honest answer is most of the time, a decent condition CRT. The full 40 minute interview with Bob is up exclusively on Nebula if you want to see the whole thing, by the way, as I obviously could not include it all here. A lot of this discussion often gets muddy when I excitedly talk about the sharpness or clarity of a CRT's image. For most older content from retro games to VHS tapes, they will absolutely look more clear and crisp on a CRT TV than a modern LCD, with virtually zero exceptions. You can get great upscaler units like the RetroTINK 5X or the GBSC AIO to scale your games to 1080p or 1440p for modern TVs. And for 8 and 16-bit pixel art games, they will be absurdly sharp and crisp, but you lose most of the blending and trickery done to make a more convincing image that only shows up on a CRT. All right, so I have very jankily set up the RetroTINK 5X Pro, which is an upscaler that can upscale retro consoles up to 1440p and kind of 4K to my LG CX OLED here. And we're gonna play a couple games. All right, we're sitting at 1920 by 1440 at 60 frames per second. I'm very excited. All right, so this is Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance. We're getting nice motion adaptive deinterlacing down to 60 FPS. A lot of PS2 games do not scale well in general, just because of the output of the PS2 and just the way the graphics were designed. It's actually looking pretty good. I don't remember what this character was doing, but like it's still pixely. You know, it's not the clearest image in the world compared to like the PC port they put out this year or last year. But like, I'm satisfied with this. It's not as crisp and clear as it is on my BVM. But I'm okay with it. I want to try some God of War. So we're actually going to go into our RetroTINK settings and do a 2560 by 1440p output, which is going to give us our natural widescreen. All right, now this looks really stellar. Like this is a lot clearer than a lot of the official ways you can play God of War right now. Obviously the screen tearing is still a problem, but all of the shimmering of like the, the, the lack of anti-aliasing going on and things like that, like you don't see a lot of this on a CRT. And like even zooming in on Kratos, all of his details kind of turn to pixels a little bit and you don't get that on a CRT, but I will say in motion, especially with the full 60 FPS. Now, this is an opportunity to explore another feature built into the RetroTINK 5X Pro, and that is the incredible CRT emulation stuff. This isn't just scan line overlays. These are like some serious CRT emulations going on. So you have slot mask, you've got aperture grill, a couple different versions. You got the BVM, which looks a lot like my BVM. You got the PVM 600, FV310 consumer sets and LCD just for fun. I'm digging the consumer, the FV310 is actually really nice as well. And it moves with the content instead of just being like a PNG overlay, so you don't gotta worry about burning from it or anything. Now you're losing some of the depth of looking at a BVM, but you get those nicer blacks. Yeah, this looks phenomenal. This is more or less how I expect this game to look. This, I, I'm sorry, I'm still playing. This is just, this looks exactly like it looks on my bigger TV for the most part. Yeah, I mean, there's always gonna be some differences as we talk about in this video, of course, but I'm putting my money on it now. Had I had the LG OLED when I was looking at buying my BVM D24, I don't, especially with these scalers, obviously the scalers weren't out yet, the CX wasn't out yet, but had I had it, I would not have bought my D24. It cost significantly more than this did. And with this scaler and the CRT emulation, like it's not the same thing. And I will continue to appreciate what I can do on the BVM and the way that it looks, but I wouldn't have feel felt as compelled to 
buy it because this is so nice. And then there's consoles like the Nintendo 64, which never looks good on a modern display, even with mods and upscalers and the works. It looks totally fine and somewhat impressive on a CRT. HD content, on the other hand, generally won't look better on a CRT. Content designed for modern high-res flat panel displays will almost always look better on those. But there are some slight exceptions. Many of us actually do enjoy using widescreen and HD CRT sets, such as actual HD CRT TVs from the end of the consumer CRT manufacturing era, or some multi-sync BVMs or broadcast video monitors. The difference between a BVM that supports HD formats and an HD CRT comes down to signal processing. BVMs still use entirely analog signal processing, so even when connecting a 480p, 720p, or 1080i source, if supported via the YPBPR component inputs, the signal is all being processed and displayed without scaling or any digital processing, meaning it's as high quality as a source as it can get while there's zero added input latency. HD CRTs, meanwhile, almost always scale your content. Some scale everything to 540p, some give you the option of scaling to 540p or 1080i. There you can often get some lower input latency with native 1080i content, but 720p will always have scaling and processing. These sets are still wonderful for watching movies, TV shows, or playing some games, but not great for games where reaction time is crucial. A lot of games released on the PlayStation 3 or Xbox 360 were still designed with tricks or visuals to keep CRTs in mind, and even at higher resolutions, they just look better on a CRT. Plus, despite 720p and 1080p output options being supported on these consoles, most games rendered at a much lower resolution and can still look blurry on modern displays, whereas they look much crisper and cleaner on a CRT. Not to mention the weird bug in the PS3 scaler causing many games to only ever support 720p output at all, making them not look great on a 1080p TV. Despite PS3 being my preferred console, I often just only bought games on the 360 instead because they looked better on my TV at the time. The reason content can look better on tubes is both due to the previously mentioned clarity gained by having images drawn in lines rather than locked pixel counts, but also the perceived depth of the image. Since the image you see is generated by light being allowed through or blocked, blacks in a scene are going to be mostly pitch black with no light coming through other than some ambient glow from other phosphors around it. The glow also contributes to the aesthetic too though. We have only finally started seeing modern TVs compete with this in the form of OLEDs, which are only really just becoming accessible to more normal consumers within the past year or two. This also means that watching super compressed video streams looks significantly better on a CRT. You actually wouldn't know most Twitch streams were full of blocking at all when you watch them on an HD CRT. It's kind of wild. It's my preferred way to watch Twitch. That's the other funny thing about CRTs is when you're talking about the smaller CRTs, it really doesn't make a difference, but the bigger CRT you get, the more space between the image that you see. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit more evident on video games because video games use about half the resolution in progressive scan. I'm not gonna nerd out too far <laughs> on you, but that's why you get those black lines in between that, funny, they're nicknamed scan lines, but it's actually the image itself are the scanned lines being drawn. It's kind of an improper term that is just stuck. You could kind of see not only the space between you know the, the, the lines themselves, but even the vertical mask. You could start to see like if you get close to a TV, like the dots that make up a video game character's eyes are farther apart. So that's why even back in the day, I remember thinking sometimes games look better on smaller CRTs because everything was closer together. Blacks are deeper, whites are brighter, colors pop more. LCDs often look more flat due to the backlighting's inability to vary brightness enough or on a per pixel basis like OLED. And even that can't recreate the literal depth of seeing a physically layered image. Another type of content that benefits here is interlaced content. Any VHS tape, many early DVDs, lots of fifth and sixth generation games, interlaced content tends to either have combing artifacts due to bad deinterlacing or bounce up and down due to how Bob deinterlacing works, and it doesn't look great. We're seeing more scalers hit the market with motion adaptive deinterlacing that fixes this, but they're expensive. This isn't an issue on a CRT. If you get a super high PVM with like a 1000 vertical line count, then yeah, you'll see it. But on normal PVMs and most consumer sets, it's not an issue at all. Lots of games swap between 240p and 480i regularly, and this also causes a disconnect for scalers for a moment, whereas it's instantaneous on a CRT. Also, some games on Xbox and PS2 support 1080i output directly 
as well. Many have tried conveying this bit of why they prefer a CRT image, but haven't been able to properly explain what they mean by depth. But this is it. Older films with practical effects that are hurt by sharpness, more punchy and stylistic films, etc. can all look better on a CRT than a flat looking LCD. But it is still personal preference. There's one other very important aspect of clarity on CRTs that we have not discussed yet. Motion clarity. The clarity and ability to discern information in the image during motion is still unmatched on a CRT, and this comes down to image retention. Some gaming LCDs or OLEDs have a feature that tries to emulate this, but it's far less common than it should be. I'll let my good friend and colleague John Linneman from Digital Foundry tell you all about it. Hi, I'm John from Digital Foundry, and I'm here to talk about motion blur reduction on modern flat panels, or techniques such as black frame insertion. Basically, what is it and why it's so important? So firstly, motion clarity. It's one of the key advantages of CRT technology, right? But why is that the case? Well, this ties into the way in which the screen itself is drawn. Essentially, the process of scanning an electron beam across a phosphor screen from the top left corner to the bottom right. As the beam crosses each phosphor, they're momentarily illuminated then begin to decay within milliseconds. Each phosphor is extremely bright for just a second, but by refreshing fast enough, the human eye sees a persistent image. But the phosphors do not remain consistently lit throughout the process. This effectively creates a period of darkness between each new frame, which, to put it simply, allows our eyes to perceive each image without the prior frame blurring into each new frame. And this is what black frame insertion, or if using something like an LCD with a backlight, strobing, is designed to simulate. That perfect motion you get on a display like a CRT. It basically blanks out the screen between each new frame. The length of this period determines the clarity of motion. This ties into what is perceived as one of the benefits of a flat panel, however zero flicker. You see, when using a CRT, you will notice flicker at lower refresh rates, but with a sample and hold display like an LCD or an OLED display, at least by default, you get zero flicker. The image is persistent with zero decay and it never flickers in any way due to how our eyes perceive this. But the knock-on effect here is that it creates motion blur. Now, in the past, when a flat panel would change between different pixel colors, basically one pixel goes to another color, the transition period was slow, which resulted in ghosting. But LCD technology has improved dramatically, massively improving these times, while it's near instant on OLED panels. So if the pixel response time is so fast now, why does it blur in motion? Well, it's not actually about the pixel response time any longer. Instead, this is down to persistence of vision, basically the length of time a pixel remains visible to our eyes. And this is where techniques such as black frame insertion, strobing and the like all come into play. The persistence of each frame is basically shortened by blanking out the screen between each refresh. The longer the blanking period between each frame, the lower the blur. The downside to this, increasing this period of time also increases visible flicker and reduces display brightness, both of which may not appeal to everyone. When used, however, this can effectively eliminate or greatly reduce persistence motion blur. Imagine playing a game like Sonic the Hedgehog on your CRT. As the screen scrolls, the checkerboard patterns of Green Hill Zone remain remarkably sharp and clear. But if you play this same stage on a normal LCD monitor without any sort of strobing or black frame insertion, suddenly everything smears together. By enabling black frame insertion, however, the motion clarity is restored and the game can begin to resemble what you might have seen on that CRT display. The problem is that the implementation of this feature seems to vary wildly between manufacturers. It's very successful in some of them, but perhaps less so in others. And in the case of something like LG's OLEDs, they've actually reduced the effectiveness of the feature with the latest models likely to increase brightness, but as you know, this just means shortening the time the image is blanked out. Another drawback is that it's difficult to combine this with something like variable refresh rate, as BFI basically needs to be synchronized with the refresh rate to work effectively. A dynamic refresh rate means that this is a lot more difficult to implement. 
Some LCD monitors do support this feature, but it's pretty rare. Despite these difficulties, however, I feel that the technique is extremely important to the future of display technologies. With a high enough refresh rate and frame rate, say upwards of a thousand FPS, it's actually possible to achieve this motion clarity without relying on strobing or black frame insertion, but delivering these results, especially when dealing with retro content, isn't exactly easy. So this is one area where I feel research and implementations need to keep evolving as we move forward. For everything that modern displays offer, the use of sample and hold ensures that persistence motion blur remains a serious problem. If you've not used a CRT in a long time or never experienced black frame insertion yourself, you may not even realize just how blurry modern displays can be. But once you see the difference, I think you'll find it's worth pursuing. I hadn't actually messed with the BFI much on my LG CX, though I've used it on my BenQ monitors before. It's pretty nice. OLED Motion Pro. There's low, medium, high. Auto is lighter than high. So high definitely darkens the image. I can kind of see the flicker. Auto looks a lot better. This actually feels a lot smoother. What if I go... Can I just like toggle it on and off real quick? Yeah, it feels a little smoother actually. So that part feels really good. The 60 FPS on this game, other than the screen tearing, is really nice. But I already knew all of this. It's why I like CRTs. The motion clarity explains some of it, but I don't have an answer as to why they feel so much snappier. Digital signal equals processing time equals input delay. It's always there, even if it's low enough that you can't detect it. However, generally speaking, analog means no input lag. It's not quite that simple, I know, but it's a good rule to keep in mind. There were digital CRTs too. These are the HD CRTs, like the one that I have. Most 4x3 aspect ratio normal CRTs will be fine, however, as they tend to be analog only. There are a tiny handful of HD or digital 4x3 CRT TVs, but they aren't something you'll encounter often. And yes, no input lag is glorious, and the only way that some people will play games. In fact, it's why I've always wanted the legendary FW900 16x10 PC monitor, so I can still play modern games. Just remember the controller, the console, any audio video switchers, and so on, all play a role in input latency as well. Measure latency compared to a 1440p 240Hz monitor, I'm using NVIDIA LDAT, which stands for Latency Display Analysis Tool. It's basically a mouse hooked up to an image sensor that just kind of detects when light changes, and we've tested it and it compares to how you would typically do with like an LED and a slow motion camera, but you can do it at scale. It runs a lot faster. I've already got the data set for the LCD monitor, but I kind of wanted to see the CRT stuff in real time. There's some factors that may affect it, but I'm super stoked to see here. So it is just waiting on me to press the button. Of course, it's designed to string over a monitor, but they don't have the string big enough for a giant CRT. So we're taping it like professionals. Oh my God, that's better than I expected. So for context, the average latency I was getting on the LCD monitor was about 12.89 milliseconds. We were looking at about 4.1. And that's with a little under three milliseconds of average actual game rendering latency, which is most of that time. So we're looking at, this is super rough data, we'll have better data in a minute. But at 120 Hertz, we're looking at about one milliseconds worth of input latency with all of your operating system, your game, and all of that going. That is insane. Now I have some other display port to VGA cables I wanna to test to see if I can get 240 hertz, hertz interlace working, cause that might be even lower. Oh boy, it doesn't even compare to the LCD side. Looking at the full LDAT data, for CSGO, the average input latency running at 1440p 240Hz on my Samsung Odyssey G7 with G-Sync enabled and settings on low was around 19.5 milliseconds. This is a measurement of the entire signal chain, from mouse click to change happening on screen. Obviously, the CRT will not be running at 1440p, so I also tried running at a lower resolution, close to the CRT res, to be more fair. But this actually resulted in a 7 milliseconds increase, as scaling from non-native resolutions on LCD displays is pretty slow. 
Running the Time Sleuth to measure display latency at 1080p results in about 20 milliseconds at the top of the frame. So yeah, a lot of time is spent scaling lower resolution images here. The CRT, on the other hand, basically zero milliseconds for pure display lag and under four milliseconds for end-to-end -end latency. That's nearly a five times increase in the input latency going from CRT to LCD, even a high-end top spec one. With Splitgate, we went from an average end-to-end -end latency of around 12.98 milliseconds to just four on the CRT. Combine that with the added motion clarity discussed before, and it's no wonder playing on a CRT feels so much snappier, even in modern games. This is why I keep it on my gaming desk, even with the 1440p 240Hz monitor right there. Just let it sink in. 240Hz, G-Sync, and NVIDIA Reflex Plus Boost is still slower than 120Hz on a CRT. Need I say more? Well, yes, the G7 is an LCD panel, and we still have to test OLED. So, at the top of the frame, again, this is not the native resolution, but it does have a little bit of a better scaler. We're looking at 9.4 milliseconds at the top of the frame to scale 1080p to 4K and to display the signal, which is actually really impressive. Like, that is damn impressive. Middle of the frame, we're looking at 12.77 milliseconds. Solid. Bottom, bottom of the frame, 16 milliseconds. So by the time you get to the bottom of the frame, because, you know, it's got to be at least 16 milliseconds to get from top to the bottom of the frame at 60 FPS, which is what this is operating at. There's no lag. So there's like a little bit of a delay to start the scale, but by the time it finished displaying it, you're not really getting any input latency, which is really nice. This thing is doing a really fast job. But part of that, you know, it, it doesn't entirely depend on the OLED itself in this case as much as the scaler involved, since the scaler in the Samsung was clearly not good. It's really nice seeing all this detail up close, I'm not gonna lie. Done, we're looking at an average of 13.8 milliseconds at 4K, 120 hertz, <laughs> which is significantly harder to run than 1440p. So yeah, once again, if I had a proper OLED as a monitor instead of a giant TV, and it was a nice one like this with G-Sync and blah, 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 I'd probably use it instead of having a CRT and a LCD on my TV, or on my desk. Let's take a look at the split gate data, 11.9 milliseconds. So at 4K 120, that's basically spot on with the 1440p 240 of my Samsung G7. LCDs are dead. LCDs are dead. That's all I got. I, this is insane. What the hell? So yeah. 240 hertz seems like a big win, but it seems like it's still a waste of money compared to an OLED or a CRT. And it seems like monitor companies are still desperate to compete with the responsiveness of a CRT, even with the upcoming 500 hertz displays. I don't really think I want another LCD gaming display ever again. All this fanboying over how great CRTs look is fun and all, but is it really worth dealing with the weight? For many, no, probably not especially not with the bigger TVs. But most small or medium-sized CRTs weigh very little and can be picked up for cheap or free and just used when you want the nostalgia or to play specific games. Alternatively, if you have different ways that you watch different kind of movies and TV shows and the like, why not include a CRT? A big thing for me is getting these off of the streets and out of the trash. Disposing of CRTs in the normal garbage is both illegal and very dangerous for the environment, and yet recycling them kind of doesn't seem to happen. Most attempts at building recycling centers for CRTs resulted in warehouses upon warehouses of CRTs stacked floor to ceiling and doing nothing with them. Getting them in the hands of people interested in them and having a little fun is a win. Plus, the more we keep from getting left out in the rain or smashed, the more we can preserve for people who want to discover them down the line or who needs parts for repair. While older tech is built to last and tends to last way longer than modern stuff, these things do break down eventually and may need repaired. They are getting very, very old now. Keeping documentation and hardware preserved helps make sure that can continue to happen. Great work is being done by people like Steve from Retrotech, who refurbishes and restores a ton of CRTs and makes content documenting these adventures, while also now touring and teaching museum staff about it too. He's the one who refurbished my BVM D24. Great work. Hey, I'm Steve with Retrotech, and in my workshop, I repair and restore analog video hardware but my primary focus is the CRT display. I've spent years researching these machines and I'm gonna help you out with some tips so you can get the most out of your CRT. All right, so tip number one involves magnetism. 
A CRT produces a magnetic field within itself using what is called the yoke. This magnetic field is used by the CRT to direct the image as to where to land on the screen. This is important because external magnetism can affect your CRT's image, causing interference and problems with color. These issues with color are called purity problems. Now, to combat this issue, most CRTs have a built-in degausser. This is the bong-style noise you hear when you first power on a CRT. The degausser is meant to clear up the screen and rebalance the magnetism of the CRT, thus correcting the colors. The big issue is lots of items create external magnetic fields that affect a CRT. These items include speakers, power supplies, and even the poles of the earth. Be careful of what you have around your CRT. All I have to do is wave a magnet in front of this CRT and it will mess up the colors. So having a degausser is key to keeping a CRT usable. Most pro CRT monitors have strong degaussers built in that can be used anytime by pressing a button. But unfortunately, only some consumer CRT TVs have a degausser that comes on at startup and others have no degausser at all. If that is the case, you will need to use a degaussing wand. Larger CRTs can be problematic as well as consumer CRT TV sets. The degaussing wand can be used to clear up magnetic issues that the CRT's built-in degausser cannot fix. Now hopefully those tips will help you boost your CRT's performance. Thank you again, Professor, for having me on today. And if you want to learn more about CRT maintenance, repairs, reviews, and restorations, then please go check out my channel, RetroTech. Just as a super quick note, if you're trying to connect a CRT monitor to your PC, the best modern way is with newer DisplayPort to VGA adapters. HDMI ones, other than the rare oddity, are generally pretty bad. But DisplayPort converters and USB converters for the older 20 series NVIDIA GPUs actually work pretty great. However, RTX cards no longer support mapping custom interlacing resolution modes. So if you want the best experience, something from the GTX 900 series or older is great as they still have DVI with the analog pins to get native VGA output and the drivers work with cool formats. Also download CRU, the custom resolution utility. Speaking of BVMs, the more sought after CRT sets are starting to get more and more expensive. In fact, the main reason I haven't been able to get an FW900 is because their prices continue to soar by people hoping to make a quick buck. But there is a man who has been living out all of our childhood dreams in recent years. I wanted to get Linus's pragmatic thoughts on actually choosing and even using the dream CRT over today's latest and greatest gaming panels. CRT displays are truly incredible tech, but Let's be real here. When you account for the lack of compatibility with modern devices, the aging out hardware that isn't being manufactured anymore, and space and power consumption, they're a pretty hard sell these days. At this point, modern display tech has been able to match nearly every strength the CRT has. Though, it should be noted that no one display tech shares all of the CRT's strengths. OLED has the great response times and the deep blacks, IPS panels have wicked high refresh rates, brighter pictures, and suffer less image degradation over the course of their lives. And both of them have sharper images and higher resolutions that make resolving text and UIs better. And at 1440p, and especially 4K, artifacts from resolution scaling and aliasing become far less noticeable. Oh, and don't forget the selection of form factors and aspect ratios for monitors that <laughs> flat out, pun intended, don't exist for CRTs. Right, and you'd also have a warranty you could rely on. But after buying the holy grail of CRT monitors and playing games on it, it kind of does live up to the hype. I've never seen a CRT quite like it. It truly is astounding. But if I was dropping thousands of dollars on my one display, I'm going QD OLED these days. I know that sample and hold display tech can't match the motion clarity of a CRT, but in my non-pro gamer eyes, that improvement is noticeable, but minor compared to QD OLED's incredible image quality. With all of that said, CRTs are an unreplicable experience and the limitations and downsides, they're kind of part of the charm. It's like vinyl records. It's about being able to experience something that you love in a new way, or better yet, 
the old way that you used to. So if you can get your hands on a cheap CRT, or please divert one from the landfill, I say go for it. Practicality be damned. It's a hobby, right? Have some fun. Oh, maybe I need to look at QD OLED. Uh, Samsung, MSI, please. Considerations that might actually be important to you also include power consumption and heat output. At least that's what people regularly say are problems. But I wanted to test for myself. Yep, my Samsung G7 uses about 50 watts of power running a game at 1440p 240 hertz, and my CRT at 120 hertz is eating about 80 to 85 watts of power. So definitely an increase. Heat-wise, it's really hard to say. CRTs release a fair bit of heat out the back, but so do all of my gaming monitors and high-end TVs. Hell, LG just released an OLED with bigger heat sinks to overclock their panels and needed better cooling even. CRTs don't compete even with the most mild of gaming PCs for heat output anyway. You also have to account for the weight. A 21-inch PC CRT monitor weighs about 69 pounds, and as you'll need a much deeper desk than you would for an LCD, it's worth considering too. Plus, wall mounts were nowhere near as elegant back in the day. In terms of gaming, while plenty of games do, some newer games don't support 4x3 aspect ratios anymore, meaning you have to stretch it from other formats like 16x10. For games like Apex and Warzone, I find the distance visibility to be too impacted to really be able to compete as much, whereas more traditional FPS titles like Halo and Splitgate do just fine. And the added performance of running at a lower resolution is a win there as well. There's a lot of technical talk in this video, but just remember, it's a fun hobby. We're exploring our passions and our interests to have fun. So if you're obsessing over it to be the most correct on the internet or to flip things for the most cash, you're barking up the wrong tree. We spent 20 years now with everyone moving to flat panel displays and giving up a lot along the way. It's just fun looking back and seeing how unexpectedly capable CRTs actually were and why LCDs are still trying to catch up to them even today. I often get asked, which CRT monitors or TVs someone should be searching for, and it's a question I cannot really answer. At this point in the market, you just kind of have to pick what's available, you know, to you. You can't, you can't go hunting for one, for the most part. In terms of PC monitors, uh, literally any will be great to start. Even if you can't run some of the higher specs, you're still gonna have a lot of fun with it and be able to, you know, do some cool gaming, but there is a bit more of a scale and supported formats there that you might wanna start looking at upgrades once you figure out if this is a hobby you wanna deal with at all. In terms of TVs, any TV with composite or ideally S-Video will be great for console gaming. Just remember to not pay scalpers for these. A lot of people are now listing CRTs on eBay and other places trying to get people who are new to this hobby or that are interested purely for retro gaming and just skyrocketing the prices beyond what they're actually worth. For example, the FW900 from Sony and the couple clones of it is my holy grail of a PC CRT monitor. 16 by 10 supports 1440p equivalent as 16 by 10 at 85 hertz or 120 hertz at other formats, but it's not worth 3000 plus dollars, especially when all of them will either have a cracked chassis, damage to the anti-glare coating, or they'll need work on the capacitors and stuff on the inside and will either need repairs or be you know, die soon anyway. Plus, especially for the higher end formats, you gotta pay a lot more for the hardware that can actually drive it at its full spec or use older GPUs, which will struggle to play the new games at those specs anyway. It's not worth paying $3,000 for. <sighs> and this is why I still don't have one. I gotta say, while I already mostly already knew why I preferred CRTs and yada yada, I hadn't truly put the data to it like we have in this video. And, I kind of regret buying the G7. I wanted a new top of the line gaming experience, but I just find myself playing anything that still supports 4x3 on my ZRT instead. Granted games like Apex, Warzone, Overwatch, Battlefield 2042, and so on don't support 4x3, but Splitgate, Halo, and Battlefield 4 do. This video was a massive project containing information that I have gathered and assimilated over the past five or more years on the channel following up a series of video essays I've you know created about CRT TVs. And there was a lot of content that unfortunately I couldn't really include in the YouTube video just due to retention. It was long enough already. Uh, but there's a lot more that I still kind of want to talk about. So I have not only an extended cut of this video, I have the full uncut interview with Bob from Retro RGB. I have the extended cuts of all of the guest spot segments from John, Linus, Steve, and Bob, as well as a couple other CRT related videos and a bunch more exclusive content over on my own video streaming site, Nebula. Nebula is a site I built with my creator friends to stream higher quality video without ads and to house a lot of this additional content that typically wouldn't do very well on YouTube. 
The site's really great, and you can get access to it through a wonderful bundle we've worked out with CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream has thousands of documentaries and entertaining content. This month, they're focusing on the Cold War, so you can watch The Spy Who Saved the World or Tales from the Cold War if you want to dive into a ridiculous point in time in our, you know, worldly history. And with all of that content over there, they saw what we were doing on Nebula and wanted to partner up. So for a limited time, you can sign up at the link below and get access to not only CuriosityStream's massive library, but also everything I'm doing over here on Nebula, including continuing watching all of this content that otherwise might not live if it were up to being on YouTube. You can check it all out for under $15 per year at curiositystream.com slash epos. That is 26% off their annual price. And yes, I said for a year, for a year subscription, you get all of this awesome exclusive content plus everything Curiosity Stream has going on, and it's $14.79. There really isn't a better deal than that. So go check it out. Otherwise, if you're looking for something else to watch, I do have a video over on my Lost Saves channel about why I play in 4x3, which is kind of tying into this video. Uh, go check that out linked below. And remember, be kind. Rewind.